Hi, everybody. Welcome back. And I uh, hope you're all suitably refreshed and looking forward to this afternoon's sessions. I uh, hope some of you also managed to get into the exhibitors' rooms. Um, it, it was a really um, quite brilliant experience. So uh, just, just uh, take the opportunity uh, when you get a moment to do that. So the session this afternoon uh, is going to be uh, looking at chairing peatland action uh, in the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. So looking at it from a, an international perspective and also the role of peatlands as a nature based solution uh, uh, and, uh, and as a response to uh, biodiversity and climate crisis in particular. So our first uh, presentation is from Diana Kapansky. Uh, Diana is the coordinator of the Global Peatlands Initiative at the UN Environment Programme. Uh, she's a conservation biologist with more than 20 years delivering a suite of landscape management and climate change programmes to inform environmental policies around the world. So hand over to Diana. Good day, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here with you from Nairobi, Kenya for this important annual gathering of peatlands champions and enthusiasts. My name is Diana Kopansky and on behalf of the United Nations Environment Program, I have the honor to lead the Global Peatlands Initiative. It's an international partnership working to save peatlands as the world's largest terrestrial organic carbon stock. Peatlands hold nearly 30% of the world's soil carbon, yet cover only 3% of global land area. We estimate that degradation through conversion and drainage has affected 65 million hectares. That's over 15% of all peatlands globally, contributing as much as 5 to 6% of global human caused greenhouse gas emissions annually. Peatlands are a carbon powerhouse ecosystem that cannot be overlooked in our efforts to shift our relationship with nature and tackle the three planetary emergencies of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. Peatland food production systems that people and companies in the UK may be investing in contribute disproportionately to climate change through process-based emissions, production, storage, transport, but also through deforestation, drainage and conversion of natural carbon stores and sinks into multi monocultural commodities. Increasing demand for growing media, for greenhouse and gardening, especially during the COVID pandemic, is also impacting peatlands health. Never has it been so important to invest in the health of our remaining natural ecosystems that can deliver powerful nature-based solutions that are affordable, scalable, and available right now. We need to raise awareness of the public to make informed choices so that government and private sectors move swiftly toward embracing more sustainable management, conservation, and restoration of peatlands. About 75% of the EU's land-related emissions from cropping and grazing result from peatland drainage, while this area covers only 2% of agricultural and grazing lands. Globally, conversion of agriculture followed by peat extraction and afforestation were the most common drivers of peatland degradation in the 20th century. In May this year, England released its peat action plan that commits to peatlands restoration, including banning the use of peat in horticulture by 2024, and measures to reduce the practice of burning peatlands. With countries growing commitments to reduce emissions, especially in the United Kingdom, Rewetting and restoring peatlands can play a vital role in their climate recovery. And the UK can have a significant contribution toward the UN Decade on Ecosystems Restoration. And on World Environment Day this year in June, the UN Decade on Ecosystems Restoration was launched with a rallying call to action for people, nature, and climate. The decade is a global movement to stop, prevent, and reverse the degradation of all ecosystems on every continent and in every ocean. This clearly includes conserving the precious nature we have left. Conservation and restoration go hand in hand, but the pace of biodiversity loss is now so rapid that we must be going beyond conservation 
by restoring those degraded and damaged ecosystems around the world, which will only succeed if everyone plays their part. The global gains of restoration action are clear. Restoring different kinds of ecosystems on different scales around the world will bring massive benefits for people and nature. It's key to achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030, including ending poverty and hunger. The next 10 years will count most in the fight against the climate and nature emergencies. The UN decade focuses on eight broad categories of ecosystems, which interact to ensure our plant, planet is healthy and some overlap. For example, grasslands or forests are also on peatlands. And all three of these ecosystems can be found in mountains. Restoration implementers are putting their initiatives and commitments on the UN decades online map. Please do take some time to make your peatlands conservation and restoration efforts known by joining Generation Restoration and putting your work on the global map. You can also share your project experience and your knowledge on the dedicated peatlands tab in the UN Decade website and even be featured in the spotlight of the main page. The IUCN UK peatland program and partners have experience and know-how that other restoration practitioners from around the world can learn from. So please do share. Conservation needs to go hand in hand with restoration. And we need to be sure that our restoration action takes special care and notice of irrecoverable carbon. Found on all seven continents, these sinks contain more than 260 billion tons of carbon in ecosystems such as peatlands, mangroves, and old growth forests. This amount of carbon is equivalent to 26 years of fossil fuel emissions at the current rate. So peatland ecosystems need to be a priority for conservation. So if the world has any hope of keeping the global average temperature increase to under two degrees, then we need all hands on deck to keep carbon locked in peatlands where it is wet and in the ground. The Global Peatlands Initiative, now 45 international partners strong. We're improving the conservation, restoration, and sustainable management of peatlands globally by bringing science to policy and practice to save peatlands as the world's largest terrestrial organic carbon stock. We're making progress in the policy domain as the world has signaled the importance of peatlands when all member states adopted a dedicated peatlands resolution for the conservation sustainable management of peatlands during the fourth United Nations Environment Assembly in 2019. The restoration is a commitment by all member states of the world to give greater emphasis to the conservation, sustainable management and restoration of peatlands worldwide in supporting the sustainable practice of peatlands management. Where we need more action is in the finance sector. Financing nature, both its conservation and restoration. UNEP calls for an investment of 4.1 trillion US dollars to halt the climate, biodiversity, and land degradation crisis by 2050. Within that are an estimated cost of 7 billion US dollars yearly for peatlands restoration. Many of us know that restoration makes economic sense for each $1 invested in restoration can generate up to $30 US in economic benefits over time. In the US alone, restoration employs 220,000 people and is a $25 billion industry. These are new, green, and meaningful jobs for youth and for rural populations. Everyone has a role to play in ecosystems restoration, and each of us can make a difference. Be a part of the solution and join Generation Restoration because we need all hands on deck to take action for peatlands, for people and our planet. Please do join us, be part of the solution at the Global Peatlands Initiative. Thanks very much. 
Thanks very much, Diana. Um, and uh, it's been hugely exciting, actually, to see the uh, see the growth and the impact uh, of the coordination of, of international efforts around peatland conservation and, and the GPI. Uh, and, and I think the UN resolution has just been kind of hugely influential uh, in that respect over the last few years. So it's uh, it's been great to work with Diana and just to see the growth in this whole area. Our second presentation uh, is from Stuart McGuinness. Uh, so um, Stuart might be a little bit tired because he's <laughs> literally just come back uh, from the IUCN uh, World Conservation Congress in, in Marseille. Uh, Stuart's the Global Director of Nature-Based Solutions Group uh, and the Director of the Global Forest and Climate Change Program uh, of the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Good afternoon. My name is Stuart McGuinness. I'm the uh, Deputy Director General of IUCN, and I'm delighted to be here this afternoon to talk to you about an issue that is very close to my heart and one that I feel there is an awful lot more opportunity to, uh, to really bring to the fore. Now, I've just come from the World Conservation Congress in Marseille, and I can be clear, uh, clearly testify that there was a very strong focus around the role and the importance of nature-based solutions to a range of societal challenges, not just climate change, but issues like food security um, and, and, and uh, safeguarding uh, vulnerable communities. Um, but there is still, I think, a real gap on the opportunities that exist for peatlands. So I'd like to uh, look at uh, look over the next 15 minutes at the role of peatlands as a nature-based solution. And I will say that uh, this is an issue that is close to my heart uh, because as a, as a young child and teenager back in the uh, 1960s and 1970s, I spent many, many hours with my uh, grandfather and my uncles up in the, uh, in the what we call the moss in, uh, in South Derry in Northern Ireland, um, uh, cutting uh, turf by hand. And I have seen actually uh, firsthand what happened when that was replaced by me mechanised processes, um, which of course, as you all know, enhanced uh, drainage, enhanced oxidation, and really led to significant degradation of these fantastically rich biodiversity habitats. Now, we're, we're, our starting point really is, is looking at the opportunities that, uh, that nature-based solutions offer for the conservation of peatlands. And as many of you know, uh, the whole concept of nature-based solutions was really advanced by our constituency, by IUCN, um, over the last decade or so. Um, in 2016, in Hawaii, many of you voted as members on a, on, on, on a definition um, of nature-based solutions that is now very widely accepted uh, across, the, uh, across the globe. And I think there's a couple of key points to that uh, definition that, that are worthwhile highlighting again. First of all, we are working with natural and or modified ecosystems. Then we are working with established conservation practices for protection, sustainable management, and indeed restoration. But also what we're doing is we have another eye on the contributions that the ecosystem services derived uh, from, from those, uh, those habitats and from those ecosystems can contribute to society. And therefore this idea that we can actually simultaneously deliver um, goods and uh, services and opportunities for human well-being while at the same stage conserving biodiversity. Now, I don't need to go to, to reiterate to you just how many benefits and, and co-benefits uh, there are with, um, with peatlands. Uh, the provision of safe drinking water. Uh, with that, I, I, I think of Loch Katrine uh, uh, above Glasgow, su supplying Glasgow with its drinking water. Um, the, uh, this fantastic carbon store 
um, more so than any other vegetation type uh, in the world. Uh, the protection of vulnerable communities, um, the uh, the modifying uh, and and, uh, and and hydrological regulation functions that allow for both water storage when there's a heavy inundation, but also for the slow release for downstream needs. And then, of course, there is this uh, the, the biodiversity uh, benefits and, and 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 its function as key wildlife habitat. And finally, uh, we shouldn't uh, forget about the strong, strong um, cultural ties uh, that exist with many communities and indeed the economic benefits that can be derived for, uh, for, uh, for many local livelihoods. We also know, and I've already alluded to that uh, earlier from my, uh, my own experience, just the number of risks being faced by peatlands. Indeed, one can argue that uh, the, the, this fantastic uh, rich uh, um, substrate uh, is part of the is part of the challenge because it is an it is attractive to convert that to rich agricultural land. Um, there we we've seen in 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 uh, various places in the world, and particularly in Indonesia, uh, rapid, rapid deforestation and drainage uh, of, uh, of peatlands to for their conversion to plantations. And again, one of the challenges, rich substrate, really great growing conditions and, and, and really pushing uh, 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 the, the driver of loss and degradation. We've also seen the, the mining of, uh, of peatland soils for horticulture. And again, as I mentioned in my, <laughs> my own experience back in, back in uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, um, the, uh, the, the, the mechanization of uh, traditional uses um, where you then see a large scale industrial uh, um, harvesting of peat for uh, brick making and uh, fuel. Uh, there are several challenges to valuing uh, peatlands and one is that they tend to be in remote out of the way areas. Um, they are difficult to get to and that means difficult for regular monitoring, uh, difficult uh, for um, e even getting in and getting good uh, assessments and good uh, of the goods services and the biodiversity values. And many countries therefore are still at an early stage of mapping their peatland and peatland values and identifying um, where they are and critically the condition that they are in. Um, and I would say this knowledge gap is particularly germane when we come to the issue of peat soil. Now I have argued, and in fact uh, last week arguing several times, that soil and soil biodiversity is still a far too often ignored um, by various sectors, including actually the conservation community, and there is a lot that we still have to do. For far too long, soil generally has been treated just as a simple substrate, um, as a means of getting nutrients and water to uh, to plants and, and, and vegetation um, and not actually properly considered as an ecosystem or in fact ecosystems in and of themselves. So there really is a significant gap still uh, with our, our knowledge around peat soil. And then of course that um, because peatlands are found in remote out of the way areas and that there is a complex social dynamic already existing whereby many local communities rely on them and live from them and, uh, and, uh, and manage them to some degree, that, there is, that this can be a real problem when uh, industrial scale activities arrive on the doorstep and we see local communities excluded both from the areas they manage and from the benefits they provide. And finally, while we've had a lot of focus on forests and the benefit of forests for um, carbon and uh, and real interest in issues like REDD plus for carbon markets. 
we have not seen the same level or the same realization of the values that could be provided from peatlands. So if we are to see this, I think the, the first thing and maybe one of my key messages is that it's not going to be driven simply by public sector investment alone. We're going to have to find a range of investment uh, sources to really uh, get that scale of activity required to uh, to sustainably manage and protect what we've got and restore some of that that we have already lost. Um, the first thing, and we've mentioned this already, is that we, st we still are in the process of documenting where peatlands are and the condition they're in. So we will have to have a better use of technology to map and monitor and manage peatlands as an investment opportunity. And of course, this is critical to actually attract, uh, attract those sources of income and investment. We'll also need to be able to work with the value chains that uh, that are already established on and that a uh, source from uh, the manage uh, uh, the management of peatland soils and make sure that they are framed in a way and delivered in a way that are actually truly sustainable and that can range from forests to agriculture um to management for a range of uh, ecosystem services um, but we really need to be able to, again, identify those uh, value chains and then start to uh, uh, optimise how they can be managed. When it, do, when it does come to the issue of agriculture, and obviously we've often seen agriculture in direct conflict with peatland conservation, but we're also going to have to find a way of being able to work uh, in, a, in, in a more harmonious way. And that is where I do think looking at the opportunities of um, polluticulture um, have, has something to offer. So being able to work with wetland agricultures that are designed to maintain the values of, uh, of, of uh, peatlands, uh, sustain their biodiversity values, yet at the same stage be able to deliver um, a productive uh, 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 value chains. Uh, that would probably mean an, an option would be to, to invest in, in uh, high value crops and also then to really emphasize and give weight to and va properly value the carbon benefits that could accrue from that. And finally, I think we really need to make sure that we are not substituting one investment with a single investment or single line of investment with one other but really looking at peatlands as, as for what they are, complex ecosystems and dynamic habitats and being able to work with a range of the goods and services uh, that they provide. Now, investment uh, possibilities are there. Several of the, uh, there are several challenges and I've mentioned some of these already, but one I will just focus on is that in order to be able to attract inv investment, we need a robust and coherent performance framework. And I'll come to why I think IUCN in particular has something to offer in a minute. Um, but we also should realise, and I think we should be enthusiastic and, 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 uh, and, uh, and be, uh, be bold in pursuing those opportunities. There are domestic and international carbon markets there, and I think we've got to make the case for how the sustainable management of peatlands can make a substantive contribution. Um, the, uh, one area that IUCN is particularly interested in is the uh, is blended finance. And again, I've said before, public sector finance won't do this by itself. Um, we need to attract private investment, but private investment is often cautious. So uh, being able to work with um, public sector investment coming in as a first loss guarantee, a junior partner, so to speak, uh, being able to absorb some of the risk and then providing a more attractive framework for, um, uh, for private sector to follow through. But clearly there has to be uh, a clear understanding and documentation of the economic returns that would be available and we need to be able to target the appropriate sectors. And I do here think 
that one area, one sector we should be looking at seriously is that of the insurance sector. Um, I've mentioned already, we do need to make sure that we can monitor performance. The private sector will want to see a return, so they will want to have a robust framework around which uh, performance can be assessed as a basis of that return. And I think then that does lay the groundwork for the development of various types of innovative instruments that we have not typically used in conservation and certainly have not used in the conservation of peatlands. That can include uh, green bonds, but we can have also other types of structured funds that would, that would be geared towards the specialised needs of peatland productivity while conserving um, its values, its ecosystem values and its biodiversity. Now, I did say that um, one thing that where I think IUCN can particularly offer a, something of, of, of use uh, and of value in attracting more investment is in offering a robust performance framework. A performance framework is not just to deliver, uh, not just to measure what the goods are, but actually are we also adhering to best conservation practice are we uh, uh, ensuring that there is proper societal involvement, community involvement and community benefits? And this is where the global standard for nature-based solutions comes in. Now, again, this has been approved and, uh, and recommended by the IUCN membership. Um, its criteria and indicators deal with what is required to get a good nature-based solution on the ground. We have trialled and piloted it in several uh, uh, areas already and there is a lot of interest and I think more and more it's being seen as a new sustainable development model. It is uh, consistent with the ICL code of good practice and on that basis we have just triggered the uh, development of a third party uh, certification scheme working in partnership with other certification schemes. We don't want to go into competition with them, but rather actually being able to offer up a module uh, for third party certification to other schemes that are certifying carbon or land productivity or um, um, pro provision of uh, sustainable agriculture or whatever. So I, I really do think, and I would hope that we would all champion that there is a real role for the global standard and being able to provide that, um, that, that, as a, that performance guarantee. I would just like to conclude with saying uh, that uh, I'm, I'm really grateful again for having the opportunity to, um, to talk to this conference. Um, I really do believe that there is a fantastic opportunity and I will highlight on behalf of the IUCN Secretariat that we are very, very keen and very anxious to work with our members, with our national committees, and really raising both the promise and the exigency of conserving peatlands, and that this can be done, and that there is a financial and economic case for that. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Stuart. Um, and uh, I should just uh, remind delegates, if I can, uh, that we will be doing a Q&A uh, session um, after our third speaker um, very shortly. Uh, so whilst we've got the opportunity of, of Stuart and Diana in particular, um, it would be good uh, to kind of hear any kind of questions or discussions on the kind of international uh, dimension. Uh, our third speaker uh, is uh, Ian Crocher uh, from Natural England and, and Ian's a senior specialist uh, uh, on, in climate change. Uh, Ian's also um, uh, been a, a long-term supporter and uh, member of the IUCN UK Peatland Programme Steering Group. Uh, and uh, so I think it's uh, gonna be very enlightening to kind of understand uh, Ian's perspective and in particular from a, a UK perspective with regards to peatlands uh, in the climate crisis. Hello. Uh, and welcome to this talk on the roles of UK peatlands in the climate crisis. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about um, uh, some of the stuff that we put in the carbon storage and sequestration by habitat 
2021 report, uh, particularly the peatland area and the peatland chapters and how we um, looked at the evidence, uh, reviewed the evidence and um, some of the fi findings we we had. The particular point of this report was really to try and compare different habitats and, and make um, comparisons between different ones so we can get a better idea and concept of, of um, what each one can deliver and, and the, the potential for uh, delivery in the future. So we know that peatlands are extremely important. That's why we work on them. So, but how are we uh, do our peatlands compare with other ecosystems as a climate solution? Are they the best? Are they the worst? Do they sit somewhere in the middle? So within uh, our sector, peatlands come under uh, the Lulu CF, land use, land use change and forestry, uh, and the agricultural section through where we've ploughed them, turned them into grasslands um, and use them for cropping. But if you compare those sectors um, to other sectors like transport, energy supply, business, residential, then peatlands alone um, are, are fairly small in that. And, you know, we still have a, a massive job in terms of taking those other sectors and really um, reducing them down to uh, a really good level of um, a very low level of um, um, climate, um, greenhouse gas. So if we look at the peatland bit in a bit more detail, as you can see here, uh, the peatland bit in the middle um, is the largest part of that um, land use change um, sector. And, you know, the real question is how quickly we can reduce these peatland emissions down uh, and make um, long term change in that land use um, thing from the, the the committee on climate change produced a report um that looked at land use policies and they stated that 22 percent of uk agricultural land should be shifting to tree planting energy crops and peatland restoration to meet our net zero goals um this is a big change that's coming in the next decade or two and um you know peatland restorations will be center most to a lot of that so how does peatlands compare with other ecosystems what are some of the, the sort of processes and and trying to explain really some of the, the the simple mechanisms that are going on here so when we don't disturb an ecosystem for a long time it's it's in a good condition then we get uh, eventually get to an equilibrium so most most ecosystems do that grassland salt marsh woodlands different levels of ecosystem depending on how much um, carbon is stored in those systems and the real exception here um, is peatlands so peatlands can go on storing carbon indefinitely when in a very good or fully functional condition um, so these this is um, one of our summary results tables and as you can see from this um, the, the highest carbon storage habitats come out are the peatland ones um, and um, yeah quite a big bigger range of uncertainties and that's very much about peat depth and, and different peat depths measured at different places um, within that Um, this is uh, around sequestration, so um, where we're taking carbon out of the atmosphere uh, and, and locking it back into the natural habitat. As you can see, peatlands um, aren't um, as good as the woodlands here, but um, but when we look down the bottom here, where we've got intensive grassland arable on deep peat, um, we have quite um, quite a lot of emissions into the atmosphere so coming from the peat out into the atmosphere um, and this is where there's a big opportunity to reduce all those emissions through land use change um, and re recreation of habitats 
You'll also notice down here conifer forest. Um, that goes both sides of, of the thing, very big range. So, you know, put it in the right place and it can be a, a, a good delivery tool, put it in the wrong place and you can really do quite a lot of damage. And particularly on our peatlands is where you get these emissions here. So um, the, how the carbon sort of works when that habitats or those ecosystems are in equilibrium, we get that stable, steady state uh, until such an event. So until we chop down the trees or we plough the grassland, we get a loss of carbon and that then over time will recover um, to back to the equilibrium. Either a new equilibrium or or a similar equilibrium. So um, change in land management can do that in a positive way and it can do that in a negative way um, over time. How do peatlands differ in, the, in this? Well, instead of it being uh, at equilibrium, peatlands will, an active peatland, one that is, you know, peat forming will um, continue to grow and, and store carbon indefinitely until we get some type of disturbance event like a drainage or something like that. Then we lose that carbon in exactly the same way. Um, as long as it goes back to a, a semi-natural habitat that's active again, peak forming over time, um, then we will get um, again carbon being taken back up and we get the carbon emissions to the atmosphere but we also get, um, you know, a lower state um, until it can recover back to that. In actual fact, a lot of peatlands, though, are actually doing more like this, where we've got that active peat. We have that disturbance event. If we then have uh, active management, drainage, ploughing that's continuing, we, st we continue to get that, that loss of carbon on an annual basis. Uh, and emissions to the atmosphere from that. So this is the, the figures that we um, found in the literature um, and it was surprising how few there were actually um, ac across all different types of habitats but this really looked at the, the different soil carbons for different habitats. W we didn't find a lot for vegetation carbon surprisingly just nobody seemed to have particularly looked at it and um, yeah so blanket bog 799 at two meters uh, raised bog um, at the average depth of the habitat you know and then fens or the deep peat fens um, slightly greater again and and as you'll see from the range here you know where you've got um, big changes in, in depth, then you we have big changes in the carbon numbers as well. So that's um, quite important um, to, to really understand and, and that depth measurement of, of the peat of the carbon um, is really important. Um, just, uh, just really to sort of demonstrate this, it, it's, um, not just about the carbon figure for the habitat, but it's also about the extent of that habitat as well. How much of that habitat is retained or remaining within that? So these are figures for England. Um, and um, as you can see, blanket bog is by far the greatest extent. Um, and then raised bog and fens uh, on deep peat are a lot, lot lower. And um, that gives corresponding um, uh, tons of carbon or million tons of carbon um, in different things. So raised bog, you know, far better because it's got a higher carbon number, but the extent is a lot less. And just to really demonstrate what's what's possible, these are the figures for the, the peatland soils for that habitat that are outside of the habitat. So they no longer have habitat on them anymore. And um, consequently, we get, um, you know, some fairly big figures here about what we can do um, 
in terms of restoring some of these back to semi-natural habitats. Um, we've also got um, emissions factors as well. So how much emissions are being given off by each hectare of peat um, gives you a, a, an idea of that. And, and a cropland really comes out very strongly, giving very high emissions, intensive grasslands. And then we go to the sort of degraded uh, bogs in the middle here and then all the way through to the more natural systems with a lot lower emissions. Um, again, we can look at the extent of these. So, you know, cropland only covers 24% of England, as an example, um, but gives out 53% of the peatland emissions for England. Um, intensive grassland, only 10% by area, but giving out 16% of the emissions. And some of the other habitats that have greater extent, giving out much lower emissions in England. So this really um, is, is a summary conceptual model um, that I've used over the years. So where we've got poor condition, peatlands, drained, dry, intensively cropped, in agricultural systems, we get high emissions. Um, and as we move up this scale of getting slightly better um, states you know more heavy dominated grass dominated peatlands those um, degraded peatland systems in the middle here all the way up to the higher level ones that have lower emissions and uh, are functioning far better and and really i guess that the aim for all of us is to move as many of these balls up to get to the highest and highest state for the ecosystem but also the, the lowest admissions for the ecosystem so what are the some key messages to summarize on this really um yeah severely degraded um peatlands um we have lots of them and there's lots of potential to restore them and um uh, it's going to be a big priority to to reduce those emissions and, and really get rid of them as much as we possibly can and um, while really protecting and retaining the habitats and ecosystems that are already uh, under semi-natural vegetation as much as possible if we compare those to you know those other sectors again at the beginning transport energy you know this should be one of the easier ones to to reduce and um, we should um, do everything we can to do that as quickly and uh, effectively as possible. Um, so this, this was our conclusions from, from the report itself, looking across all of those habitats. And, and as you'll notice, protect and restore peatlands comes out the top. It is the highest, what we think is the highest, the most important um, thing to do. It's a restricted land use, if you like. Peatlands only exist where they've naturally formed uh, over the millennium. And uh, so we need to protect those and restore them where they are. Uh, and then put other things like native broadleaf woodlands, coastal restoration, our other semi-natural habitats um, around them so they don't compromise them and, and really help restore those as much as possible. So this was our, our overall summary from our report and please do go and uh, look at it and read it. Um, you know, it was compiled by um, a, a number of us uh, climate change people at Natural England and uh, it, it's really got lots of useful other information in there beyond just the, the peatland chapter and area. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so thanks to all of our virtual speakers who are now live in the kind of virtual world here in front of us all, uh, the wonders of modern science. Um, there's uh, a good few questions come in and uh, I've uh, got a few other things that I think have been prompted uh, by presentations there from Diana and Stuart and Ian. Uh, we've got about half an hour, so they may well be 
opportunity to get another couple of questions in uh, if you want to fire those into the into the uh, Q&A. Uh, but we'll start off uh, with, with Ian, if I, if I can. And it, I think it uh, quite nicely follows on, Ian, uh, from some of, the, some of the points you were making there, and particularly your messages at the end. Uh, so I'll read out the question, if that's OK, uh, and ask you to respond, Ian. Uh, most carbon is to be gained where peat lost was greatest. Should we not also assess the potential role of restarting peat formation in areas of lost peatlands. This could be a huge amount of carbon as model scenarios have indicated. What, what do you think? Should we be, uh, should we be doing that? Should we be prioritizing it? Um, I think we should be definitely doing it. Um, it would be definitely very interesting to, to research it and, and look at it in a lot more detail. But I think the most important thing is protect the carbon that's already there. So that's where we should be putting the most money and then trying to really reduce those emissions um, from our peatlands. So, yeah, I think it would be really interesting, particularly to really build that evidence about what's happening and how much more peatlands can sequester, particularly when we, you know, actively manage them to do that. But, um, yeah, not at the expense of doing those other things and, and protecting what we've got because we don't want to use those and then reduce those other emissions that are already happening and already out there on an annual basis. Yeah, D D Diana, I don't know whether this kind of point has come up elsewhere in, in other country strategies. Um, I don't know whether the, the recent uh, German strategy has identified this. I, I guess a quite a large area of, of their peatlands historically would, would have been lost and converted to agriculture. Yeah, Stuart, it definitely, I mean, Germany is in a very difficult state because they have a huge amount, I think it's more than close to 90% of their peatlands had been converted or, or used for other um, uses, like mostly agriculture. I want to just reemphasize what Ian said, we've got to urgently invest in protection in those peatlands that are not damaged that are have irrecoverable carbon stores and that are also really well linked um, and providing a critical role for people, um, you know, for water, water quality, water storage, and also really stabilizing microclimates. So I wanna echo that. I, I do see that there is an important piece here when we talk about restoration is the rewilding aspect. Um, we do see a lot of commitment and a lot of funding towards um, restoration efforts that we, you know, UK especially has, has seen that some of the restoration costs, costs are exponential because, you know, you're having to remove trees, um, you know, and do enormous amount of of blocking of drains. And I think we need to be careful in our words when we say forests you know, we really have got to be talking about reforestation and rewilding rather than afforestation. And I think that putting, you know, in uh, putting back peatlands, peatland um, species into habitats where they can start to regain their function and regain, um, you know, rewild that place is really quite critical. So I would say, yes, it would be a very important um aspect of decision-making around restoration. I, I guess that raises a, a kind of interesting point um, around, I guess, competing strategies even for nature-based solutions. And uh, Stuart, I don't know whether this kind of emerged in, in discussion, conversation um, at, at, uh, at the World Congress or even the previous one when uh, the kind of debates were happening, I think, around definitions of nature-based solutions and you know, what, what we've seen certainly in the UK is that, you know, there, there is potential uh, for kind of competing nature-based solutions on, on, on a single piece of ground. And maybe, you know, for peatlands uh, that, have been, that have been drained, um, I think there is the real uh, danger or threat that that could actually get converted to forestry, uh, you know, which may deliver some kind of very kind of positive outcomes for biodiversity and, and for carbon and for water, 
but it might not be the ideal solution. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know, Stuart, whether um, the conversations now have, have got to, a, I guess, a, a level of sophistication where the decision-making around nature-based solutions can address or, or diminish maybe some of these kind of competing demands? Thanks, Stuart. Um, two things I'd just say on that. Um, one of the things that was very interesting, part of the narrative that really came out, I would say, at the, at the World Conservation Congress in Marseille um, a couple of, just a couple of days ago, um, was that we, we need to stop talking about these two crises, um, biodiversity over here and climate over here, as if they're separate. In fact, there's two emergencies, but there's actually one crisis. And this issue came up quite a lot. That there, the, the, the crisis is actually how we uh, as, uh, as humans are actually using and abusing the planet and that there are, and in fact you have uh, you had speakers like Christine Lagarde actually highlighting this, it's, a, it's the two sides of the one coin. And I say that because if one then extends, if one moves forward um, on that, um, the, I think part of the issue then is it's not just a question, I, and I think I, I highlighted this in my, in my presentation, of simply substituting the delivery of one good or service with the delivery of another, but really actually starting to think about how we restore the multiplicity of goods and services um, at, um, uh, uh, at the same time. The nature-based solutions, uh, uh, the global standard for nature-based solutions actually has got a criterion that explicitly addresses this um, it just doesn't ask for no further damage to biodiversity. It asks, uh, it asks for evidence of biodiversity net gain. And so I think actually that is, that is part of the inroad to that. So I think, I think you are correct. And this is, a, this is a risk. And there was indeed a moral hazard there that we would sort of substitute one thing with another. And you'd sort of get a, that might be slightly more acceptable. But really, it was still far, far away from where we want, needed to get to from a conservation perspective. But I would say there's several, I, I think, first of all, this discussion around realizing that there's that, that the biodiversity and climate crises are so interwoven and therefore the solutions have to be interwoven. And then the other, I say, coming through, looking at nature-based solutions and realizing this, this issue that there has to be a strong and demonstrative uh, um, biodiversity net gain, I think help us move, uh, avoid some, uh, some of the risks that you mentioned and move us into a more desirable uh, direction as uh, Diana was uh, was mentioning vis-a-vis -vis, uh, sort of approaches to rewilding. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, I, I'm just going to pick up on uh, something uh, that you uh, touched on, Stuart, as well in terms of um, uh, gaps around knowledge, particularly of, of uh, soils and, and obviously we're talking about peat here um, and uh, Diana I wonder whether you could just say a little bit more um, about the progress that um, that we're making and, and that you're making through the GPI on on this new global assessment of uh, peatlands. Thanks so much uh, Stuart and I think we are seeing a real push globally as um, Stuart has shared about the criteria and indicators uh, being built up on nature-based solutions. Similarly, there's a lot of getting to work with IUCN, FAO, UNEP, and multiple stakeholders, including um, the incredible research community that has been sharing openly and for free their knowledge and expertise, especially around the decade uh, targets and monitoring and mapping um, metrics. So that conversation is also happening um, within the decade team and consortia and the Global Peatlands Initiative as well is um, about to launch a full-fledged process for a global peatlands assessment. It's a huge gap that um, policymakers and also um, the world has been asking for as we increase visibility on the opportunity of peatlands and their importance, then you know people are really asking about what is the current state. So the Global Peatlands Initiative is, has launched a process that's following an IPCC and it best blended process. Um, 
as it's going to be a voluntary um, coordinating lead authorship, we are counting on nominations and expertise from around the world. We're going to be organizing that global peatlands assessment around the regions because we do know that um, you know, we need to take an ecosystem or biome-based approach to this assessment. And we're going to top and tail that assessment with chapter on data information. How are we doing? What does it mean when we say peatland? Um, and also, uh, what, are the, what are the mechanisms and opportunities, the drivers around policy incentives and financing? So topping and tailing that conversation. The coordinating lead authors are having actually a meeting next week um, to really dive down and agree. Uh, we're not going to have the perfect peatlands assessment by, by any stretch, but what we're going to be is incredibly transparent on what we've got. And it's a coalition for action, bringing together the best science we have to really try to put peatlands literally on, on a map and really understand where they are and also how they're understand how they're changing. So that is, we're, we're inviting the contributing lead authors and anyone to also nominate contributing authors. Um, if there are experts that you think need to be a part of this process, we're really open to receiving um, anyone's contributions as we may. Now that will be launched as well officially, the Global Peatlands Assessment, first um, first uh, try at a, at a new global peatlands probability map at the COP. And then we're going to work on improving that, identifying hotspots, hotspots of degradation, hotspots for opportunity, hotspots of high carbon, irrecoverable carbon places, and so on and so forth. So really we're, combining expertise across the conversation around nature-based solutions, around the um, setting up of the monitoring and metrics on the decade, and also then this global peatlands assessment. I think what really what's important as well is to see the place of peatlands within the landscape. We can't say peatlands or wetlands or oceans or forests. We've got to look you know, at how these ecosystems interact. Thanks so much. Yeah, and it's, I think, hugely exciting uh, to kind of uh, uh, think about the prospect of, of, the, uh, of this new global peatland assessment. And, and as we know, certainly from the UK's perspective, it's, you know, it's, uh, it, it's never a fine art and, uh, and, and it will always be kind of refined. Um, and, and of course, we're not starting from, uh, we're not starting with a blank sheet of paper. Um, but I can see it's going to be a, a really, really kind of significant and influential uh, milestone uh, and uh, will really kind of help to progress, I think, uh, global understanding and, and act as a foundation for, for further policy and action. So it's, it's brilliant that that's happening. Um, uh, Sorry, I want to just add in a little bit. Sorry, Stuart. Yeah. I just wanted to say, because there's also a real incredible spirit of collaboration across the peatlands community that I wanted to really acknowledge because we've got also a global peatlands initiative research working group. So really we're working hard to elevate and really try to create a gold standard so that we can compare across different places, both in space and time. That's nothing that's really existed before. So this is something that partners like C4, partners like, um, well, Mark Reed actually is, co is the co-chair of this research working group. And we're both being able to engage and influence new early career researchers and also getting the incredible immense knowledge of seasoned uh, researchers as well. So it's really been a wonderful sort of merging of the generations um, because we really do need all hands on deck to get this done. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, and is, there's a opportunity for people to contribute. Uh, is that right, Diana? Indeed, reach out to me and uh, we'll get you plugged into the process. Thanks. Good, okay.
Uh, okay, I am going to come back to the um, COP26 and, and messages and things, but we'll maybe kind of leave that towards the end. Uh, Ian, if it's okay, I'm going to come back to you. There's a couple of questions uh, come in. Um, and uh, I'll just read it out if that's okay, Ian. Can you see the questions as well, Ian, by the way, or are you flying blind? Uh, I, I can see them if I'm on the right screen. Right, okay. <laughs> and I should just let everybody know that um, you know we're, we're kind of working off the Q&As here, so we're a bit blind in terms of if there's other chat um, been going on. Uh, so I, I can't reference that, but um, we're just going to focus on the Q&A. Uh, so Ian, um, if you could uh, maybe uh, respond to uh, one of the questions. Um, the evidence seems far from clear on some management alternatives. Do we know what happens to unmanaged, let's, let's call it blanket bog, considering climate change? And do we need vegetation management to prevent establishment of trees and wildfire risk, especially on drier sites? And, and I guess that's a very relevant or pertinent kind of issue uh, with regard to, to climate change. It's, so making these sites as resilient to climate change as possible, I think, is is very much about wetting them up, which is the best thing to do um, for so many things. Um, yeah, we we still need to manage them when they're in degraded condition until we can really get them in the best condition they are in. Um, you know, and adding water back into these wetlands uh, because a lot of them are very very dry, uh, and the management and pollution and all the other impacts they've had um you know we need to address those and, and put them back and and i guess it's about really really thinking about what what we want these things to do to us in the future and, and really put them back into the best possible place to deliver the most uh, benefit to society and people and and the climate yeah i think that's a really important message ian and, and i think it's a really powerful but simple message around rewetting um, peatlands in particular I think as a mitigation against uh, against wildfire or, or managed fire I suppose um, and uh, you know that's obviously not just an issue for the UK that's a, that's a really significant global issue too. Um, uh, Stuart if you don't mind I'm gonna just come to you. Uh, you mentioned uh, the role of or the potential role anyway of, of uh, insurance and the, the insurance industry uh, as a contributor to the kind of blended finance models. Could you just say a little bit more about that and uh, and the insurance industry in particular? Uh, yeah, thanks, Stuart. Um, maybe, I'll, I, again, I, I just I just want to start maybe by reiterating this point. I think uh, Diana mentioned the figure of, uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Diana, I think you said about 7 billion, um, I think was your, your estimate. And if we are, if we are, if we're going to see that sort of, uh, if we see that demand at uh, that, that le level for for finance for to address both the uh, the biodiversity and climate emergencies, then I think it's, it's clear this will not come from public sector funding alone. So we do need to find innovative ways of reaching into the into the private sector. Now, when it comes to insurance. I think actually the starting point there is actually the um, there's, there's probably two points. The principal leverage probably is uh, working with the insurance sector and looking at how they set uh, set their premiums. That can be context specific, um, de um, depending on the services. And I think there's two things actually. It's it's looking at um, if there is um, activities and if they are in providing insurance for activities that exacerbate damage and therefore there is loss associated and obviously um, and there's obviously then loss associated with that damage and that, that, that you're talking about higher premiums but equally if you if we're actually looking at being able to avoid damage foregone to to peatlands and therefore the services they provide that can actually offer an opportunity for lower premiums, and it's so that the insurance, how the insurance uh, sector sets uh, premiums for other sectors, uh, be government or private, can actually then start to drive uh, behaviour. The other thing that the where I think the insurance sector can really help out 
is um, in supporting governments, and it is linked to that previous point, on how they structure bonds. There is, I think there's a lot, we've only scratched the surface on, uh, on, on how governments um, can, well, let's say governments principally, um, can raise, uh, raise bonds for investing in activities such as the, uh, the maintenance and hopefully even the restoration um, of, uh, of, of peatland ecosystems. And there to, to really ensure that that is structured prob properly and, uh, and again, that the, the, the goods and services are valued and the benefits uh, and the, uh, um, are valued properly, I think the insurance sector can actually provide some solid uh, guidance in, in, into the structure, how those bonds can be structured for maximum effect and impact. Thanks. Thanks, Stuart. Um, just picking up or adapting a, a kind of comment that's come in uh, on, on the Q&A. Um, uh, it's around, I guess, the balance of uh, resources that are going into uh, supporting research and the evidence base, which you might kind of argue is absolutely necessary to give uh, um, uh, financiers or investors in, in you know, whatever their objective is, uh, the kind of confidence and assurance that peatland restoration is delivering a, um, a kind of certain level, uh, you know, kind of quantified benefit. I, I know from my own experience that um, there is a, a, actually a demand now and an increasing demand from investors, I think, who are looking to um, uh, align themselves with a, with a restoration and kind of conservation agenda. Um, but is there a bit of a mismatch, do we think, uh, between uh, the level of resources that are kind of underpinning the evidence base and the potential level of resources which are now going in uh, to supporting the kind of active restoration work? Um, uh, a, a question open to, to any of you, really. I am. Um, I'm quite happy to have a, a first a first go at that, Stuart. If that's okay. Um, I think I, I think that is the case. I mean, and and this has been mentioned many times. Uh, that it's it's not actually that money or resources that's the problem. It's actually to have uh, what is termed bankable projects, projects that actually would be attractive for private sector investment, and uh, that would actually be able to give those returns. Um, and that and those that hasn't and so getting the, the pipeline of of, of projects into, into the market has been a real challenge. However, I do think that we are actually starting I'd say really in the last two years um, we are starting to see structures come in place that actually can facilitate that and I'll, I'll give you um, um, three examples. Um, two of them are actually directly related to uh, to peatlands. Um, the with with bodies like the Green Climate Fund, where what we have seen now is that there is support for both a technical assistance component, precisely to do that, to put the structures in place, to do the research, to set the baselines, to be clear on uh, that there is uh, that there is sufficient knowledge in place to underpin good performance uh, metrics that that the private sector will invest or that sort of private sector investors will require should i say um and at the same stage then to make investments uh, and i mentioned this in, in, in my presentation of uh, to, to absorb the some uh, uh, to absorb some of the risks the so-called first loss guarantee and so you're actually, we're actually starting to see a, an interesting set of projects emerge. We have just um, had one, uh, not particularly um, uh, related to peatlands, but more broadly to uh, supporting climate activities at some national level. That has actually been, there's a technical component to it, uh, which IUCN uh, manages, but then there's a, a loan, a pure loan, goes out to, the, to uh, uh, an investment manager um, to actually give, uh, to give that confidence that there is that any immediate risks can be absorbed through that and that is sufficient to tr attract in um, a additional private sector investment. So you can think of it sort of as, as three elements, 
resources for the TA, for the technical assistance, resources for uh, underpinning that sort of so-called first loss guarantee, and then that is sufficient to attract in the uh, 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 regular investors. Uh, and I mentioned two other projects. We're actually working on this. We're working with C4 and the uh, Global Green Growth Institute uh, and the GCF at the minute on a similar sort of initi initiative in the Burbank landscape of, uh, of Sumatra and Jambi province, uh, precisely with that sort of structure in place. And then we are very proactively exploring with GCF at the minute, a broader mechanism for, global for a global peatland program that again, we'd sort of try and do that, uh, provide that, 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 that sort of structure. Grant-based technical assistance combined with loan-based first loss guarantee, which then attracts in additional private sector investment. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, okay, I think we've probably just got time for, for one more question, if that's okay. Um, I think it's a good one to end on as well. Uh, so a uh, question to all of you, maybe I could start with Ian and then Diana and then um, Stuart, give you the opportunity to pause for breath. Um, so what are your key messages uh, that we need or do you think we need to take to COP26 with regards to peatlands? And, and this is kind of important after COP26, how do we keep the international effort maintained? So simple question, but uh, <laughs> the answer to the meaning of life. Uh, uh, can we start with you, Ian? So Stuart already picked up a bit on this, but the climate and ecological crisis are, are, are massively interlinked and peatland needs to be at the forefront of solving these. Um, so we've really got to invest in our peatland restoration as one of the best and most readily available um, solutions that we can go out and deliver straight away and yeah i guess it's it's really about making sure we've got that finance and and backing for the long term and also perhaps you know get some of that research into into the things that that we don't have answers to now but we need more clarity for in the next 10 15 years so really looking long term I, I, I don't know about you, Ian, but I kind of feel that, you know, we've made great progress in the, across the UK, the four nations, um, in, the, in the policy community, in the scientific community, and, 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 and actually the political uh, community as well. Um, uh, what about the public? Do you think there's a, a, do you think there's a bigger job that we could do? Uh, do you think we've still got a way to go there? Yes, I think certain parts are definitely coming on side and, and understanding that and and horticultural use of peat and all of those sort of yeah. stories have have a place to play in that and and people need to explain that but yeah i mean generally the person in the street doesn't understand some of these things and and aren't making buying decisions on, on these issues where a lot more people you know if they knew more about it would be really really good to support it and and I guess you know different sectors like agricultural sector and you know forestry sector are all all learning around peatlands as well as we go. Okay, uh, Diana, your your messages to COP. Thanks. That's that's a difficult one because I think I want to say many things because I think there's a lot of messages around peatlands that people need to hear and and including the public. I want to just also say that most, for, first and foremost, we need urgent investment in peatlands, and that's them healthy and beautiful, and that's them degraded and needing action. And I think that around the financing discussion, we've got to change the rhetoric. We've got to create, um, you know, we've got to create criteria where equal and urgent investment in conservation, especially on peatlands happens at the same time as we offer carbon credits and opportunities for restoration investment. I think that we, as the community that's driving these decisions need to insist on it. And we've got to move beyond the discussion around commodities. So I think, you know, we have to recognize that 
economies are not just built on commoditization. We um, need people, we need them healthy, we need them happy. And um, a lot of the services that natural ecosystems give us are, are not part of that trading uh, center. So I think we need to move, move that uh, rhetoric in that direction. I really think that a message for COP is that there is an opportunity for new green jobs that are meaningful for youth so that they can stay where they are or go to nature as they wish. And um, that governments need to be um, investing and, and private sector and all need to invest also in the research. You know, there, it, you don't just get one piece of the puzzle. You've got to invest to fill the gap. And I think that um, the exciting thing is, is that long term, which is not a conversation only about uh, climate issues, as we know, but long term, our messages will be very similar towards the um, global biodiversity framework to the discussions at the Ramsar COP and also at the other um, UNCCD land deg degradation neutrality commitments and the Convention of Migratory Species. And all of these MEA secretariats are actually being brought together with the Global Peatlands Initiative to really discuss what does a call to action look like? How can we show that by prioritizing peatlands action, conservation and investment, we can advance multiple global agreements at once together. And I think that my message is we've got to do it together from every uh, facet um, and also from any generation. Thanks. Thanks, Diana. So it's a good point. If anybody saw my address, my opening welcome address this morning, you'll have seen I was promoting Shetland ponies uh, as our um, orangutan for the uh, equivalent for UK peatlands. So that, that's got to account for something, surely, Ian, in the uh, in the public consciousness. Um, okay, uh, Stuart, if we come to you. Uh, uh, lastly, if that's okay, uh, messages for COP26. I, I suspect you've absorbed a lot of messages over the last week. Uh, yes, uh, I'm uh, probably messaged out. Uh, I, yes. I, I've got actually very little to add to what Ian and, and, and uh, Diana said. Um, I, I would, I think, I would just reiterate this point, which again, and this is not new because both have touched on this, that we have the, that these emergencies, the climate emergency and the biodiversity emergency, are fundamentally linked. That we have at hand a no regrets option that it can actually address both and can actually deliver dividends to both. And I would actually say that we have got, we are, um, that there is now sufficient knowledge with a, uh, that we can actually um, start to make this attractive for both public and private investment uh, because we, you, it has to be paid for, one has to get resources into it. So I would say here's a no regrets option We've got several. We've got several mechanisms that are ready. And why do we wait? This is something that we can move ahead on straight away. What well, some of the other issues may be more complex, but this is something that we could get moving on um, in, uh, in in December December this year if there was the appetite for it. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I think that's a good message. It's it's uh, yeah, it, it's one that I think we've been pushing for a little while now, but. I think we've got the kind of strong evidence base and the momentum um, to, to get that utterly um, believable and sold. Uh, look, uh, thanks everybody. You've worked uh, really hard. Uh, it's uh, quite a challenge, I think, to uh, respond to all of these questions. And uh, thanks for the effort you put in on your presentations too. Um, uh, I suspect this is coming from one of our IUCN uh, colleagues here, um, but just to remind everybody, there's an opportunity for delegates to share what they think the most important advocacy mes messages should be uh, to position peatlands around COP26. And, and that's going to be in the, or well, that's in the uh, feedback survey uh, in, in the menus tab. So that's your opportunity, if you like, to add uh, your ideas into that uh, final conversation. Okay, uh, so that's us. Uh, and thanks again to our speakers. In the real world, you'd get a clap now, but um, you just have that kind of little awful um, <laughs> clap.
click to leave. Yeah, clap. Um, click to leave and kind of slightly flat moment, but uh, I'm sure everybody's clapping. You just can't hear or see them. Uh, okay, everybody's got, got a little break now, and uh, then uh, we're back at 3.40 uh, with a session around conserving and enhancing the most readily uh, recoverable peatlands. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, and uh, we'll see you in the next session. Thanks for the chat.